Welcome to worship this morning, Troy Church of Christ. We're glad you're here and hope that the worship will be uplifting to you as we praise God. If you would, please stand for the first two songs. Lord, the light of your love is shining in the midst of the darkness shining. Jesus, light of the world, shine upon us. Set us free by the truth you are bringing us. Shine on me. Shine on me. Shine, Jesus, shine. Fill this land with the Father's glory. Blaze, Spirit, blaze. Set our hearts on fire. Flow, river, flow. Flood the nations with grace and mercy send forth your word Lord and let there be light Lord I come to your awesome presence from the shadows into radiance by the blood I may enter your brightness Search me, try me, consume all my darkness. <clears throat> and on me, shine on me. Shine, Jesus, shine. Fill this land with the Father's glory. Blaze, Spirit, blaze. Set our hearts on fire. Flow, river, flow. Flood the nations with grace and mercy. Send forth your word, Lord, and let there be love. 
My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame. Holy lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking <clears throat> When darkness fails his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. His oath, his covenant, his blood, support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, Oh, may I then in him be found, Dressed in his righteousness alone, Faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. Be seated. Since we have few tenors, if any, um, I'm going to ask the altos to come in on the second verse, second time through, and the bass on the third time through. We'll sing it through five times. Lord, be there for me when I fall. Be there for me when I call. Be there for me, dear Lord. Lord, be there for me when I fall. Be there for me when I call. Be there for me, dear Lord. Lord, be there for me when I fall. Be there for me when I call. Be there for me, dear Lord. Lord, be there for me when I fall. Be there for me when I call. Be there for me, dear Lord. Lord, be there for me when I fall. Be there for me when I call. Be there for me, dear Lord. Good morning. <clears throat> it's so good to see each and every one of you here this morning. I want to remind everybody, please be sure to check your bulletin for those uh, updates to our sick and to our prayer list. Uh, we want to offer our deepest sympathies to Jimmy and Lee Ellen and the rest of their family and the passing of Jimmy's father. Uh, a few announcements before we get going. Our next senior outing is January 26th. January the 26th at 6 p.m. This will be at the home of Greg and Renee Ferguson. There's a sign-up sheet out in the foyer for anybody who's interested in attending that. So please be sure that you sign up because that's I think it's just next week, right? Um, so next week, 
week after? Week after. I don't know. Don't listen to me. Um, that's January 26th at 6 p.m. So if you're interested in going to that, please sign up. Um, there are t-shirt order forms on a table uh, just underneath our new What's Happening bulletin board. These are church t-shirts. Um, there are very crude pictures on the form of what the design will look like. Uh, there are better pictures in the slideshow that scrolls through before services start but if you have questions just be sure to let me know um, these shirts are going to cost about twenty dollars per person um, so just be aware of that the deadline for these forms is february the 19th uh, and once you fill those out please just get those back to me uh, one per family there's just indicate the number that you want you it, you can figure it out it's a very very simple form um, our next fifth sunday of the month or fifth sunday rather uh, is this month here at the building, uh, we're going to have a contest and prizes for best chili as well as best cornbread. Uh, so this will be our first annual, maybe first only, I don't know, uh, but chili cook-off between Troy and Exchange Street. So if you have a good chili or cornbread recipe, please be sure to bring that. Um, we also are going to need drinks and desserts. Um, but if even if you don't want to enter the contest and you want to bring chili or cornbread, please be sure to do that. We're going to need uh, as much food as possible. So uh, just keep those things in mind. Again, please be sure to pay attention to your bulletin. Are there any other announcements that need to be made this morning? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. It's Ms. Laura Griffin's nephew. Uh, please be sure to keep that family in your prayers. And then our family of the week this week, I believe, is Miss Brenda Akers. Um, so please keep her in your prayers as well. Okay, Beth Muse is supposed to come home today. We're hopeful. Good deal. Now with me, please. Our Father, we thank you for this beautiful day and all of its many blessings, Father. Father, this morning our hearts are heavy with the passing of a song, Father, especially the Smith family this morning. We just ask that you be with Jimmy and Steve and the rest of that family, Father. And also for Lori Griffin's nephew who passed away this past week, we ask that you be with them. And and also for the Norton family who lost their loved one two weeks ago, Father, just, just be with all these families and comfort them as only you can at this time. Father, we want to ask a special blessing upon Beth Muse, who had a pacemaker put in this past week. Hopefully she'll get to come home today. And Father, for Jess Whiteside and his rehab, we just pray that all that will come out for the best, Father. Father, there are several others in the bulletin. We'd like to pray for, for them, Father. Just be with all those families. And Father... This week being the family of the week, being Brenda Aker, we ask a special blessing upon her. We're so thankful for her and all that she does here at Troy. Father, we ask that you be with our search team, searching for our youth, new youth minister. Father, we just pray that you will send the correct one here for us. Father, we want to continue to pray for unity here at Troy. We've been so blessed with it in the past. We just pray for it in the future, Father. Let each and every one do our part to get that, Father. Father, we want to pray for our military, especially those on farm fields. Just be with them and comfort them at this time. Father, we ask that you be with Nathan as he brings us the uh, Lesson of the hour, and Father, as always, if there's anyone here who is not named by name, let them do so before it is everlasting too late. Go with us now through the further exercise of this service. We've been faithful in the end. Give us a home in heaven with you. 
Christ's name we pray. Amen. Before the Lord's Supper, let's sing Lamb of God. Your only Son, no sin to hide, but you have sent him from your side to walk upon this guilty sod and to become the Lamb of God. Your gift of love they crucified, they laughed and scorned him as he died. The humble king they named a fraud and sacrificed the Lamb of God. O Lamb of God, sweet Lamb of God, I love the Holy Lamb of God. Oh, wash me in his precious blood, my Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. I was so lost, I should have died, but you have brought me to your side to be led by your staff and rod and to be called the Lamb of God. O Lamb of God, sweet Lamb of God, I love the Holy Lamb of God. O wash me in his precious blood, my Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. Right before we take the Lord's Supper, and just to reiterate what's in the bulletin about a family or a person that we pray for each week, don't underestimate that. Prayer is so powerful. And you know, there's things that go on that's public known, you know, and there's a passing of someone or an illness or a tragedy, and we lift them up in prayer as we should. But I think, if we're honest, each one of us can attest that there's times in our lives when we all have struggles, that there's things that can go on in our lives that very few people may know about, or maybe even no one knows about, that we struggle with, that we have a difficult time dealing with. And that's something that we all need prayers for. And you know, last week we started just because it's alphabetical order, it just happened to be the errands. And if you forgot to pray for them every week, every day last week, well, then we're not going to pray for you when it's your turn. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Now, if you forgot about it, that's okay. You just have a double assignment this week. You see, this holds us accountable. It makes you have to pray every day. To lift up those who need it that we know in a public way, but to lift up that particular person or that family of this family. Because prayer is powerful. James chapter 5 and 16 says, The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. The prayer of one. Can you imagine if we have a hundred and something people praying every day for a week when it's you? Do you believe that can make a difference in someone's life and in the circumstances they're facing? I do. Just real quickly, Genesis chapter 18. God was told Abraham, just step aside. I'm fixing to destroy Sodom, destroy them all. And you remember the story. Abraham, he petitioned God. Well, what if there's 50? Well, what if there's 45? What if there's 40, 30? He went all the way down to 10, and God kept saying, okay, for 10 righteous people, I'll spare them. He was willing to change his mind. In Exodus 32, at Mount Sinai, after they'd built the golden calf, God told Moses, pretty much, step aside, I'm fixing to wipe them all out, 
because of his anger, and I'll just start all over with you. You remember Moses' plead? Please, God, don't destroy him all. If you do that, the surrounding nations will say, look, you just delivered them out of Egypt to bring them out here and destroy them. In a prayer, a petition to God changed his mind. What about 2 Kings chapter 20? The prophet Isaiah went to King Hezekiah to tell him that he was fixing to die and you need to get your house in order. But Hezekiah went before the Lord and wept and prayed to spare his life. And the Lord added 15 more years to his life. You don't think God can change his mind and help people? How about John chapter 2? When Jesus' own mother, they ran out of wine at the wedding feast. And he said, you know, listen to my son. He'll tell you what to do. And you remember Jesus? Mother, my hour has not yet come. It's not time for this. But because of her request, he changed his mind and performed a miracle. You know, I believe prayer works. The Bible says it does. And if we can have a hundred and some people in this family praying for every single person in this church family, not only to change their circumstances or what they're struggling with, but to change that person in those circumstances, I think God can do some powerful things with our family here. And that kind of leads up to the Lord's Supper. Because see, the prayer is powerful not because of the one who's asking the prayer or the petition. It's because of the one that we pray through. You see, 1 John 2 tells us that we have an advocate before the Father, Jesus Christ, who speaks on our behalf. 1 Timothy chapter 2, it calls Jesus, he's a mediator. There's only one between man and God, and that's Christ Jesus. In Hebrews 7, it says that Jesus is at the Father's right hand, constantly making intercession for us. You know, when he died on the cross, you know, in the gospel it tells us that simultaneously as he died, that the curtain in the temple was torn. And what that signified, you know, was that separation from the holy to the most holy place. That in the old law, the high priest, only one person, on only one day of the year, could go stand before God. But when Jesus died on the cross and that temple was torn, it signified that all of us now have access to the Father. We all have access to God through Jesus because of what He did on the cross and His death. He died to take away our sins, and because of our sins being taken away, we can go through Jesus now to present our request and our petition to God. All because of Jesus. Prayer is powerful. It's not because of us. It's because of what Jesus has done for us. It's because of what He did on the cross. Let's go to our Father in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, and we're just so humbled that you care about us and you love us enough that you would come to this earth in the form of a human being and your son to live among those you created, to be persecuted and scorned and ridiculed and made fun of and ultimately be put to death. Put to death by the people you created and you loved. And your Father, you did that because you didn't want any of us to perish. But you took the burden of our sin and put it upon yourself so that we could obtain your righteousness. And because of that, we can be found sinless because of you. And we can come to our Father and speak to him. And he listens. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for us. And thank you, Jesus, for interceding on our behalf and speaking to the Father on our behalf. We pray this morning that we'll honor your son, Jesus, that we'll honor you, Jesus, and your body that hung on that cross. In Christ's name we pray, amen.
dear Heavenly Father, we uh, we just come before you again, and now we want to take of an emblem which will hopefully remind us of the blood that your Son shed on the cross. The blood that signifies that all of our sins are taken away when we trust in that sacrifice and put our trust and hope in you. And I pray again that we'll honor you as we do this as a family. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's pray again. Dear fathers, we reflect on the sacrifice of your son and what you gave up as a father and Jesus, what you gave up in your own life just because you love us. If we can somehow have that same spirit of giving to show how we love you, and this is one way we can do that. It's only a small way. What you want is for our dedication and our lives to serve and glorify you. And I pray that at this particular time, we'll do that by giving back how we've been blessed. It all belongs to you anyway, God. And thank you for blessing us and help us be a blessing to others. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Bind us together, Lord, bind us together with cords that cannot be broken. Bind us together, Lord, bind us together, Lord, bind us together with love. There is only one God, there is only one King. There is only one body, that is why we can sing. Bind us together, Lord, bind us together with cords that cannot be broken. Bind us together, Lord, bind us together, Lord, bind us together with love. As we stand and sing, I will sing the wondrous story, a children's church can be dismissed. Let's stand, please.
I will sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me, how he left his home in glory for the cross of Calvary. Yes, I'll sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. Sing it with the saints in glory gathered by the crystal sea. I was lost, but Jesus found me, found the sheep that went astray. Through his loving arms around me, drew me back into his way. Yes, I'll sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. Sing it with the saints in glory gathered by the crystal sea. He will keep me till the river rolls its waters at my feet. Then he'll bear me safely over where the loved ones I shall meet. Yes, I'll sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. Sing it with the saints in glory gathered by the crystal sea. Be seated, please. Scripture reading this morning is Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. So then remember at one time you were Gentiles in flesh, called the uncircumcised by by those called the, the circumcised, which is done in the flesh by human hands. At the time you were without Christ, excluded from the citizenship of Israel and foreigners to the covenant of promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus... You who were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who made both groups one and tore down the dividing wall of hostility. Good morning. It is a great day to worship our God. Amen? Amen. I'm excited that you're here this morning. I'm excited that we get a chance to worship our God together to start our week off in that way. Uh, if you will, keep in mind uh, this afternoon and later this evening, a group that we've got traveling back from Orange Beach. Uh, a lot of our youth group traveled down to the Gulf Youth Rally this weekend, uh, and they're going to be coming back tomorrow. So please keep them in your prayers that they come back safely. Uh, in a few moments, we're going to sing an invitation song. Uh, that's a time that we set aside at the end of each service, that if you've got prayers that you would like, if you've got something that you want to be made known, uh, two of our shepherds are going to be at the back of the auditorium. You are more than happy or welcome to go see them, uh, to talk to them, to hug them, uh, to let them know what it is that you need. And with your permission, we'll let everybody else know what that is as well. Uh, this morning, we're going to continue looking at uh, this idea of being stronger together. Uh, I know in, in most everybody in here knows this, uh, at least most of us probably do anyway, because it was one of Ron's favorite things to talk about. Uh, but if you've, uh, well, w- one of the most, in my opinion, unique things in all of nature is the, uh, the giant sequoia redwood trees that you can find out uh, in California. Uh, I think that they're incredible. They're they're just these massive, incredible trees. Uh, They can grow up to 380 feet tall. They can be up to 30 feet in diameter. They really are truly just unbelievably impressive. And if that weren't impressive enough, if that didn't make them unique enough as things in nature go, then you start 
studying the, the root system of those particular trees. Uh, and I know Ron has talked about this before, but I find that to be just so interesting. Because when I was growing up, we had Bradford pears in our front yard. Uh, my wife hates Bradford pears. For those of you who know Chelsea, she's allergic to them. She can't stand them. It's a good thing we live in West Tennessee, right? Because they're nowhere to be found around here, right? Uh, but we had Bradford pears, and my mom always hated Bradford pears because for whatever reason, uh, after X amount of years of having them in our front yard, they would always, for whatever reason, fall over. Uh, my mom explained to me growing up the reason they always fell over is because they would grow to these big tall heights and they'd have this big giant uh, you know, greenery on them, but they didn't have enough of a root system, so they caught all the wind and they would fall over. Well, I thought, if Bradford Pears did that, surely a tree that grew up to 380 feet in the air would catch an awful lot of wind, right? You would think that they would fall over rather easily, especially when you consider that the root system of these giant sequoias doesn't grow more than a couple of feet deep in the ground at all. But the interesting thing about that is, is they stand, or some of the oldest living trees, they stand because the root system of these trees grows outward, sometimes up to 150 to 200 feet, and the roots intertwine with all the other trees that are around it. So when you go and you look at these forests, every single one of those trees is connected to every single other one of those trees because of the massive intertwined root systems that grow underneath, just barely underneath the surface. And I remember thinking, if that wasn't the perfect illustration of being stronger together, of how as individual Christians sometimes we have situations in our life where that wind wants to knock us over, but when we connect ourselves to each other, that right there makes us stronger. And that to me was one of the most best examples I, I could possibly think of when it comes to this idea of being stronger together. That being our theme for the year. That's what we're going to focus on. Each month this year, Lord willing, we're going to look at one aspect or area of, of our life where we can apply being stronger together. We can practice some of these principles that are laid out for us in the Bible. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verses 9 through 12 is really what are going to be our theme verses for the year. Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 12 says, Two are better than one, because they have a good reward for their efforts. For if either falls, his companion can lift him up. But pity the one who falls without another to lift him up. Also, if there are two and they lie down together, they can keep warm. But how can one person keep warm alone? If someone overpowers one person, two can resist him. But a cord of three strands is not easily broken. See, that's not the only place in Scripture that speaks to the importance of unity, that speaks to this idea of being stronger together. Excuse me, Proverbs 17.17 17 says, A friend loves at all times, but a brother is born for adversity. Philippians 2, verses 2 and 3 says, Make my joy complete by thinking the same way, having the same love, being united in spirit, intent on one purpose, doing nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility consider others as more important than yourselves. Our scripture reading this morning from the book of Ephesians was emphasizing the unity that we have in Christ. That at one point in time you were far away. At one point in time you were without Christ. There were distinctions that mattered in terms of upholding the law. And at one point you were without hope. But because of Christ... Because of what he did, he made both groups one. He tore down the barriers that were that dividing wall of hostility, as it would say. And later in that same letter in Ephesians, Paul is going to write, and he himself gave some to be apostles and some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors, some to be teachers, but to equip all saints for the work of ministry to build up the body of Christ until we all reach unity in the faith and the knowledge of God's Son, growing in maturity and stature measured by Christ's fullness. And so the Bible makes it very known, very clear to us, that there is something to this idea of being stronger together. That's why all throughout Scripture, you and I are referred to as a family. It's why the early church, if you go back and you study the early church, or the church at Corinth, or the church at Thessalonica, it's why community was such an important aspect of what they lived out. And we don't understand that a lot today. We talk a lot about Christians and, and the things that we're being persecuted uh, and things that, you know, maybe we have ideals that aren't as, as popular uh, as what they, uh, you know, as what the world says. And 
I'll just be honest, it's not the same as it was in the early church. You talk about somebody being set apart in culture. The church, that was it. That's all you had. You didn't have a bunch of people that, no, you, you were actually despised. You were actually rejected. You were actually, there was no such thing in the early century as Christians who had friends that were non-Christians, that did not share their same faith. It's not the same for us today, right? I'm sure several of us in here have friends that aren't Christian, that aren't religious, that aren't accepting of Jesus and His teaching. The early church emphasized community because they realized that they were stronger together. It's why doing the right things is usually easier when you're around other Christians. Right? As a teenager, what did you call You called that the, the, the church camp week, right? You get to go to church camp for the week and everything's easy. And what did they tell you on the last day of church camp? Every single year. For anybody that went to church camp, maybe some of you didn't. But on the last day of church camp, every single year, no matter what camp you went to, they told you, hey, it's easy now, but when you go back home, you've got to do the same things. The same is true for the church today. Last we looked at the import, not just the importance of being stronger together, but we looked at this idea that being stronger together is actually a privilege. It's a responsibility. It's an expectation even of being a Christian. We looked at that also all too important question, am I my brother's keeper? And so if we can agree on that, we can come to the realization that yes, being stronger together is important, that it does matter. The next question has to be how? How do I become stronger together? How do we get to that point? What are some things, some actual things that we can do as a church family, as individuals, to nurture this environment that we're striving for? And that's what we're going to focus on this morning. But before we get to that, I'm going to give you four things this morning that you can do that are very practical, that you can do starting today. Uh, four things that, that you can do. But before we get to those four things, I want us to understand a couple other things. Number one, I I want us to understand that, that what we're doing, these four things, building this type of culture is a process. The four things I'm going to give you this morning, they're not one-offs. You don't get to do it one time and go, okay, we're stronger together. Right? No, it's something that has to have a continual impact on your life. Back to the church camp illustration, right? It's easy to do it for one week. But it has to be something that we live out each and every day of our lives. It's not something that we can go, okay, I did this once and now I'm good. That's not what being a Christian is about, period, right? Nobody says I get to be a Christian one day a week and then I get to live the rest of my week the way that I see fit. No, being a Christian is a lifestyle. It's how we dedicate ourselves, not just to Christ, but to one another. And so understand that none of this is a one-off. This isn't something that we're going to do. We don't get to do this for just a month, and then we magically become stronger together. These are things that have to be focused on, that have to be put into practice. And these are things that at times are going to be easier than others. That doesn't make them less important. Just because you can do something when it's easy doesn't necessarily make it more important than doing it when it's hard. In fact, generally, it's the exact opposite, right? Generally speaking, doing things that bring us closer to Christ are more important when they're hard as opposed to when they're easy. Even Jesus would talk about that. He said anybody can show love. Anybody can love somebody who treats them well, but it's loving your enemies. It's praying for those who persecute you. That is the real test. And so as we go through the year, I hope that you and I can make a commitment to these things, to practice them, to do them continually, to progress toward the goal that we have of being stronger together. So, Okay, let's get to it. What are these four things that we need to do? Well, the first of which is prayer. We need to pray about the things that we have going on this year. Kevin stole all of my comments, so I could really just skip this point if I wanted to. Kevin and I have an ongoing joke that for whatever reason, we never share notes and end up speaking on the same thing all the time. Uh, I don't know what that is per se, but it shouldn't be a big secret to us that our priorities are directly reflected in our prayer lives. The things that we want, the people that we care about, always end up in our prayers, or at the very least, they should. And of course, we've all heard several of these verses on prayer, right? On the importance of praying as it were. Like James chapter 5, and verse 16, Pray for one another that you may be healed, because the prayer of a righteous person has great power in its working. 
It's talking about praying for one another. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18 says, Praying at all times in the Spirit, with prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints, for one another, for other people other than just yourself. Philippians chapter 4, and verse 6, Do not be anxious about anything. But in every, everything, in prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests made known to God. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 through 18 says, Rejoice always, pray without what? Ceasing. Pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And so it only makes sense that if we're going to prioritize being stronger together, if we really want to have a closer and stronger relationship with those in our lives, that we should focus on it through prayer. If this is truly a goal that you want to have, that you're going to put effort toward, it cannot help but show up in your prayer life. This is part of the reason that we're specifically encouraging people to pray for another family here each week of the year. If we get through the entire list by the end of the year, we'll just start over, right? That's why we're doing these things, because praying for other people is something that brings us closer together. When somebody tells you that they've been praying for you in times of, of, times of stress, yes, it, it makes a huge impact. But if somebody tells you that there's literally nothing special going on in your life, right? I know that it's hard because everybody has something special going on in their life. But if you've ever had somebody tell you that they've been praying for you, and it's not out of any sense of they need my prayers because they're struggling or they need my prayers because something bad has happened or they need my prayers because their, their family members are going through a tough time. If somebody, there's nothing special going on in your life and somebody says, I'm praying for you, it makes you feel better. I don't, I don't know if anybody's ever had that happen to them where there's, they've been prayed for and there's nothing, spe- I know that sounds so bad to say, but there's nothing special, right, that we would consider special going on in your life. It's just a Tuesday. It's just a Tuesday, and I got a text that somebody was praying for me. That makes a difference. It makes people believe that we care about them. So pray for those people that need prayers. Pray for those that you think might don't need prayers. Be specific in those prayers. Pray with your spouse. Pray with your family. You think, well, Nathan, that's awkward. Should it be, though? I mean, should it really, if we're Christians, should it really be awkward to pray with my spouse or pray with my family? To pray specifically to God for the things that, that I'm looking for? That I look for opportunities? That I pray for Him to grant me the ability to care about others? To be stronger together? Be able to go to God on behalf of others. When we realize that the avenue of prayer that we have to be able to pray not just for ourselves, but on the behalf of others as well. That is such an incredible blessing. And it's something that we all have in common. Even Jesus made it a habit of practicing prayer. He would oftentimes even go away and, and refuse to, not refuse, but would separate himself from teaching others so that he had time to pray. Paul was constantly telling the churches that he wrote to, go look at, at the church at Corinth, go look at the church at Ephesus, go look at the church at Rome about Paul writing to them, church at Philippi, Paul would tell them constantly, hey, I am praying for you. Why? Not just because they had issues. I mean, don't get me wrong. A lot of the churches did have issues. But when he says, I'm praying for you, it's almost always with Paul out of thanksgiving for them. Because he cared about them. And if we care about others, if we care about being stronger together, Why would we not want to involve God in that process by specifically asking Him to be a part of it? The second thing I'm going to let you all know, we need to invest in the lives of others. Being stronger together means at some point or another, you actually have to care about somebody else. We have to actually care about one another. We have to being stronger together means getting beyond the relationship of Sunday morning. Hey, how are you? I'm good. That's great. And then I don't see or talk or hear from you again for maybe two or three weeks. We actually have to care about one another. We need to care about what's happening in the lives of one another, which again is a lot easier for some people than others. Right? I'm an extrovert. If you've gotten to know me over the last year and a half, almost two years, I'm an extrovert, okay? I can have a conversation with a complete stranger. It won't bother me at all. I married an introvert, right? That whole yin and yang thing that we got going on. Sometimes it's easier for me to have conversations with strangers than it is for Chelsea. 
And we accept that about one another, but we have to be able to invest in the lives of others. There are some people that are private people. They don't want anybody knowing what's going on in their life. They don't want anybody to get in on on the things that they're dealing with. But being stronger together means that we're going to invest in the lives of one another. And again, this is not me saying that you need to like broadcast your entire life situation down on Main Street every single week. But there are people here that care about you. There are people here that want to know who you are. Aside from just where you sit in church, right? Because that's how we generally know people. Who's that? Well, they sit here, right? Anybody ever done that before? No, surely not, right? And we've never described anybody by where they sit as opposed to who they are. We have to care about one another. Being part of the body of Christ means that you and I are to care for one another. We try not to speculate a whole lot when we study Scripture, but sometimes on occasion, I can't help it, okay? It's just part of me. I really sometimes am curious, though, about where Timothy might have ended up without Paul. Or where Paul might have ended up without Barnabas. Or where David might have ended up without Jonathan. Or where Peter or Andrew or James and John might have ended up without Jesus. All of these people that made it through some really good and some really difficult times did so because they were willing to invest in the lives of others. Specifically those who they were close to. Those who they shared a common faith with. And so we have to invest in the lives of others. Nathan, how do I invest in the lives of others? Well, I'm going to give you two reasons, all right? I'm going to give you one easy, one hard. You ready? The easy one, pay attention to the calendar. We still have calendars out here next to the bulletins. Grab you one. Pay attention to it. You know what's listed in there? Almost every single person's birthday and anniversary. If you don't have a birthday anniversary listed in there, let us know because we would really like to make it known when your birthday anniversary is, right? So pay attention to that. Send a card. Send a text. Give somebody a call. Tell somebody happy birthday. Right? Anybody in here have Facebook? A lot of Facebook? Yeah, people have Facebook. Anybody in here on Facebook get happy birthdays from people that you haven't talked to in 12 years? I do. I'll just be honest. Right? And yet, for whatever reason, it sometimes makes us feel good that somebody that we haven't talked to in 12 years tells us happy birthday. How much better then would it feel if everybody at church were to call me and tell me happy birthday on my birthday? Because I believe they actually care about me in that regard. Tell somebody happy birthday. Send a card, send a call, send a text. And then number two, this one more importantly than the first, invite somebody into your home. All right? Some of you got some really nervous looking faces just then. Invite somebody into your home. You think, Nathan, I don't want anybody in my home. My home is a wreck. I have two kids under the age of three. Okay, Nobody's house is dirtier than mine. I just I guarantee it. That's not a knock on me and Chelsea. We've got two kids under three. All right? Pick up is not part of their vocabulary yet. Invite somebody into your home. Be vulnerable with them in that way. Let them know that you care enough about them that you want them in your life. You want to invest in the lives of others? Let them know you outside of just Sunday mornings. And build that relationship with them. Ever since the beginning, God understood that man did not function well alone. We need others to live out the Christian life. Romans chapter 12 verse 12 says, Love one another with brotherly affection. And watch this. Outdo one another in showing honor. Outdo one another in showing love. Outdo one another in showing honor to each other. Hebrews 13 uh, 3, excuse me, in verse 13, but exhort one another every day as long as it's called today. As long as today is called today, you and I have the responsibility to invest in the lives of others. The only way that we become stronger together is if we all understand and truly realize that we care about one another. And we show that in no greater way than investing in each other's lives and the things that we do, not just here, but in every single aspect of our life. Number three, focus on unity. One of the biggest problems the modern church has is that for whatever reason, we can't seem to get along with one another. Which seems really strange, right? Because you might sit there and think, oh, I like everybody that I go to church with. But there's always that one person that annoys you just a little bit more than the rest of the people that you go to church with. Nobody say names out loud. Okay, we all know it's the preacher. It's fine. Uh, But we need to focus on unity. 
We claim to all be on the same page, but when we th- then we let a bunch of things that don't really matter get in the way of us being the body of Christ, which is really the exact opposite of how we're supposed to live. Psalm 133 and verse 1 says, How good and pleasant is it when God's people live together in unity? 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11, Finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice, strive for full restoration, encourage one another, be of one mind, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 28, There is neither Jew nor Gentile nor slave nor free. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. You see, the church is constantly referred to in the Bible as one. One body. One family. One church. Do we have to agree on every single thing all the time? No. But if we want to be stronger together, if we want other people to realize that they're missing something without Jesus, and they were to look at us, what are they going to see? Are they going to see a bunch of people that bicker and complain about one another? Or are they going to see somebody or people who are focused on unity, who are different, who are called to be different because of the one faith that they all have in Jesus Christ? We have to be able to focus on unity and the things that Christ emphasized and cared about. And then fourthly this morning, show up. Show up. This is something that's incredibly hard at some times and again, incredibly easy at others. Showing up is easy when we've got nothing else to do. Showing up can be hard though when it becomes a bit of a sacrifice. But for this year, I want to challenge everybody to make a priority Make it a priority. Make an effort to show up. Show up to our small groups. Show up to Bible classes. Show up to Fifth Sunday. Show up to whatever event it is that we've got planned. Show up for others when they're going through difficult times. Show up for others when they're going through really good times. Show up for one another. And in doing so, show up for Christ. Go to the funeral visitation. Go to the the award ceremony. Go to lunch with somebody. When somebody's having a good day, when somebody's having a bad day, we've talked about it before. Showing up may be the simplest thing that you can possibly do that has the biggest impact on somebody's life. Think about people that showed up for one another in Scripture. Turn over if you go to the book of Acts. This is kind of where we're going to close out. Acts chapter 9. I mentioned this a second ago. This is one of those big, big what-if moments to me. But in Acts chapter 9, starting in verse 20, really in verse 19 is where I'm going to start. After taking some food, he regained his strength, and Saul was with the disciple in Damascus for some time. Immediately he began proclaiming Jesus in the synagogue, saying that he is the Son of God. And all who heard him were astounded and said, Isn't this the man in Jerusalem who is causing havoc for those who called on his name? and came here for the purpose of taking them as prisoners to the chief priests. But Saul grew stronger and kept confounding the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. And after many days he passed, the Jews conspired to kill him. But Saul learned of their plot, so they were watching the gates and uh, gates day and night, intending to kill him. But his disciples took him by night and lowered him into a large basket through the opening of a wall. So again, this is Saul still Saul at this point, proclaiming the gospel. And nobody wants to believe him because they're saying, hey, isn't this the guy who was just telling us that he was going to kill us for proclaiming this Jesus? But watch in verse 26. When he arrived in Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him. Which makes sense, right? Everybody's like, why is everybody afraid of Paul? Well, at this point, he's Saul, right? And, And a lot of people didn't trust him all that much. A lot of people thought he was might still trying to kill them. And you can't really believe him. Why? Because he had been doing it for, for a few years already. They did not believe he was a disciple. This is a side point. This is a bonus point. You guys ready? Why did nobody believe that he was a disciple? Think about that for a second. Why? Because up to this point in his life, he had not lived out like he was a disciple. There's your bonus point for the day. If you want people to look at you and see you as a disciple of Christ, it means that you have to live like a disciple of Christ. Barnabas, however, took him. I love Barnabas. Barnabas, however, took him and brought him to the apostles and explained to them how Saul had seen the Lord on the road, the Lord had talked to him, and how in Damascus he had spoken boldly in the name of Jesus. 
Saul was coming and going with him to Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. He conversed and debated with the Jews, but they tried to kill him. When the brothers found out, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. And the rest of that chapter is going to talk about how the church grows in all these different places that Paul is going to end up. I love that because the impact that we have just by showing up, just by vouching for somebody, can reach more people, can have a greater impact than you and I may ever realize. Barnabas didn't have to do what he did, but he did it. And because of that, Paul's ministry was made effective. And so as the year goes on, I want you to think about these things. I want you to think about all these things. I want you to think about praying. I want you to think about focusing on unity. I want you to think about investing in the lives of those people that you're sitting next to right now. And I want you to think about showing up. I want you to think about all the things that you can do to cultivate a place, a culture, and to become a people who are stronger together. This world, this life, is difficult enough on its own. You and I need people to do it with us. And what a better people than those that share our faith in Christ. So this morning, if you need prayers for that, if you need to start thinking about other people as, as maybe more important than yourself, caring about, investing in the lives of others, if that's something that for years and years and years you did faithfully and you look and take an inventory of your life and you realize that it's something that just hasn't been a priority for you and you want to get back to that, if there is a need that you have, putting on Christ in baptism for the remission of your sins, we would love nothing more than for you to do that this morning. If you have a need and we can help, won't you come as we stand and as we sing? I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad.